Okay, good evening. I'd like to welcome everybody to the Kent City Council Workshop. Today is Tuesday, August the 17th. We got two report out tonight that we're looking forward to hearing. One is the water system update. And we got Sean Bowers who's going to present that. And then we got the Kent Senior Center Need Assessment. And uh, Julie, Director of Parks, will be presenting that. So, Sean, all yours, sir. Thank you, Councilmember Boyce. Uh, this is your first live presentation right last year was at home uh sitting at my desk and i think right. i had shorts on ah, well no shorts today sean okay I tell you, this morning knowing i had to uh, be here tonight i uh went to pull out the old presentation clothing i was worried if the old covid physique was going to agree with ah, that. well you, you you're looking Come good on, i'm here you're looking good sir no tie all right <laughs> well thank you for your time uh today every year around this time we like to uh, provide you guys with an update on what's going on with the water system today i'll touch on water supply water quality upcoming rule changes projects we've completed since last year and things we're working on right now Remember to do this. So our water su supply continues to be strong, even with the above average temperatures and below average rainfall we've been experiencing. Staff operate maintain 16 wells, two springs, and our surface water supply from Tacoma. For our groundwater sources, groundwater recharge started out average uh, in the fall of last year through December, and then we saw above average precipitation from January through April. For our Tacoma Green River supply, uh, the snowpack was about 120% of normal this year, and the Corps of Engineers reached full storage behind the dam uh, back on June 3rd. We began using stored municipal water behind the dam on June 29th. That's when the minimum river levels were reached on the Green River at the Palmer Gauge, where they have to monitor that um, near the Tacoma Filtration Facility. On July 14th, the state of Washington declared a drought uh, drought emergency for much of the state. While many of the state's watersheds and groundwater resources will experience diminished water supplies this summer and early fall, the Tacoma, Seattle, and Everett water supplies are experiencing near average runoff, and that includes Kent. This is in large part due to the abundant snowpack that fell in these watersheds throughout this past winter. With an emergency declaration, the state can authorize emergency withdrawals emergency water right transfers, and provide emergency grants and loans to systems that are affected. Although we continue to maintain adequate water supplies, we do continue to recommend that Kent Water customers use water wisely. Water system demand started out the year with average water use until the heat wave we experienced in late June. The week of the heat wave, we saw the average daily water demand increase from 9 million gallons a day to 11.5 million gallons a day, which exceeded our five-year uh, maximum. These are flows we typically don't see until late August. Our peak day demand has been about 12.5 million gallons a day on both uh, June 28th and July 28th. And back in the day, I believe it was in the mid-90s, uh, our peak day demand back at that time was about 17 to 18 million gallons a day. So. Mm. Even though it's high, it's not as high as it used to be with water conservation and things of that nature. So we continue to see water use remaining in the above average range. For our Tacoma supply, the Howard Hansen Dam additional water storage project continues to move forward. The Corps held a series of workshops with regional stakeholders to work through a single port or multi-port concept for downstream fish passage and are moving forward with recommendations uh, for a multi-port design. The next step is to complete a Department of Army approved post authorization decision document by 2024. And then the remaining timelines are to initiate pre-construction engineering and design or PED as they call it in 2025. This is assuming that uh, it receives congressional authorization and appro appropri appropriation, easy for me to say. Completing the PED then by the end of 2027. Construction should be completed by 2030, and they should be, uh, begin passing salmonids by 2031. Prior to the downstream fish passage uh, uh, becoming operational in 2031, the Corps is managing peak flow events to protect fish spawning beds downstream of Howard Hansen Dam, and are working with Tacoma and federal, state, local, and tribal stakeholders to identify opportunities to better manage flows during juvenile salmon migration that occurs in the spring when Howard Hansen is filling. That's a lot. Yep. 
Routine sanitary surveys of Group A water systems are required every five years. There are minimum component, a minimum of eight components of all routine sanitary surveys. They review planning and management documents, distribution system and status of our cross-connection control program, source and sanitary control areas, source pumps and pumping facilities, source treatment procedures and equipment, monitoring, reporting and data verification, finished water storage, and, uh, and operator certification status. There's usually one day spent in a meeting type setting followed by a day or two of field visits where they go out and um, visit sites. Our sanitary survey was held on June 10th of this year. The meeting portion was heard or was uh, held um, remotely and then we had field visits at our 212th treatment plant, Garrison Well, 6 million gallon 2 reservoir, pump station number 3 and pump station number 4, and rethrow tank. Our overall inspection report was very positive and staff are recognized for their professional and all being professional and always striving for excellence. Recommendations re received by the Department of Health in the report were to continue with our water storage re reservoir vent replacement program at our 6 million gallon 1 tank, our Blue Boy tank, and our rethrow tank. And we are currently in design for a retrofit of our 6 million gallon 1 tank, which I'll touch on a little further in the presentation. Improve the seal on our access hatches at our 6 million gallon 2 reservoir. That's the reservoir in the bottom right corner. Add log sheets at sites with online water quality instrument, instrumentation to track differences between grab samples and analyzer readings and document adjustments made to the analyzers when staff are there. And have startup and shutdown procedures available for staff on site that are separate from the operations and maintenance manuals to make it easier and quicker to access if needed. Staff are currently working on all of those items. Our, oops, I better switch it. Our annual water quality report was completed earlier this summer. A postcard was delivered to our customers, letting, letting them know the report was available to view and provides a link to view it. A printed report is also available to anyone who requests it. Typically when that card goes out, we know everybody uh, received it because we start getting a handful of calls for wanted printed copies. So we have those available. The report contains information on where our water comes from, how it's treated, what was found in it through, and what was found in it through water testing. And in, in addition, we like to take the opportunity to pass on information relating to wellhead protection, water conservation and water use efficiency, cross-connection protection, water system accomplishments over the previous year, and things we're working on, as well as it contains uh, contact information for the city. In addition to droughts, heat waves, and long lead times on orders for things such as pipe, water meters, meter boxes, etc., etc., uh, this summer we were faced with a water treatment chemical shortage. Westlake Chemical in Longview, Washington experienced an electrical failure due to a bad power transformer. Westlake is the sole producer of liquid chlorine, chlorine gas, and sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide we use to adjust the pH of the water. Uh, electricity, water, and salt are used in the process to produce all those chemicals. During the supply interruption, water treatment chemical distributors worked on bringing in alternate supplies via rail tank cars from California and Utah. We had a sufficient supply and were never impacted, but we were communicating with our distributors for a long-range plan if the need arose. Westlake was able to make repairs and get back up and running around the 25th of June. And it's my understanding that when they purchased the replacement transformer, they, re they purchased an additional spare one to have on site. So in the future, if something like that was to happen, um, they could make repairs quicker. They were down about three weeks. The public comment period for long-term revisions to the lead and copper rule are wrapping up. The final rule revision is set to go into effect December 16th of this year with proposed compliance by October 16th of 2024. Some of the major changes are a new lead trigger level, updating water service line inventories, and new tiers for sampling plans. The action level for lead is 15 parts per billion, but there will be a new trigger level of 10 parts per billion. That means if any samples for lead come in at 10 parts per billion or, or above during sampling, you must reevaluate your corrosion control treatment practices and recommend treatment modifications to the Department of Health. 
Reassessing and updating our inventory of water service line material in the distribution system will also be required. The outcome of these materials will de determine the sampling tiers for the revised lead and copper sampling we'll need to develop. The city has not had an issue with lead levels even prior to corrosion control treatment. We typically see lead levels when we uh, conduct sampling of less than one part per billion. We are currently in the process of sampling for lead and copper right now in the distribution system. This was last done in 2018 and was required every three years. So we dropped off uh, 50 bottles Monday and I believe we were able to get 30 back today. So the guys will be out um, trying to get the other 20 <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> Sean, who do the testing? So you, you get the water sample, you guys take it somewhere or do you test it here or what? Uh, we have a lab that samples for it. Um, there's hold requirements on lead and copper sampling. Um, the tap must not have any water flowing through it for six to ten hours before the sample is collected. Okay. And it's the first draw. And so we can't, we can't do that. We can't guarantee we can go into somebody's house and collect a sample and water hasn't been used yet that day. So the homeowner uh, collects a sample for us. So do you call the homeowner? How did that work? Yes, yeah, so we sent out letters uh, last month. Okay. Um, most of the sample locations, are they've done it for years for us. So we sent out a letter telling it's coming, asking if they want to participate again, and then they respond via phone or email, um, and we go from there. Okay. My favorite word, polyfluoralkyl substances, or PFAS. As, they, as they're called. They're a group of chemicals used in the manufacturing of a variety of products like Teflon in non-stick cookware, water repellent in clothing, and in some firefighting foam. PFAS have most of them detected around military bases, airports, and fire training facilities. The state is working on rulemaking to set a state action level that would be in effect until the federal government finalizes a national rule with a maximum contaminant level allowed. Maximum contaminant level, or MCL, for a contaminant in drinking water set by the federal government. States can then take what is called primacy of the rule, and they can set tighter restrictions, but not uh, less stringent. The state is looking at setting an action level for five PFAS chemicals that range from 10 to 70 parts per trillion. We tested for these substances back in uh, between 2013 and 2014, and none were detected. So we're pretty confident when this rule comes out, there will be no effect on us. The new state action level is set to be adopted this winter, with utilities beginning initial sampling in 2023. Environmental engineering staff were recently at a council workshop providing updates on the Landsberg mine and cross-connection control, so I don't have anything new to add, but I did want to mention that the water quality staff continue to monitor the groundwater in the area is part of the, our well air protection program, and to date we have not detected any potential contamination leaving the mine site through our sampling program. So we continue to watch it. In addition to routine maintenance activities, there have been quite a few projects completed since last year that I'll go over next. With the completion of the 640 pump, uh, pump station last year, we were finally ready to implement our new 640 pressure zone on Kent Seas Till. The 640 pressure zone encompasses the general area of 228th to the north, south to 256th, and between 108th to the west and 124th to the east. On September 15th last year, staff isolated the 640 pressure zone from the 590 pressure zone and began incrementally raising the level in the tank until we reached our final operating level of 640 feet above sea level. This process took about four weeks to complete and has raised the pressure within the new pressure zone 20 PSI over what it was. It's been working um, flawlessly too since we started it up. We haven't had any issues. Guys did a, a great job on the startup. Um, had a couple valves we had to find that um, weren't closed, so it took a couple days to figure where those out were out, uh, and but uh, it's been working great. So, Sean, so when you test those, oh, I see the pipes and stuff in the picture here, so that's what you're really just making sure they can handle the pressure is the purpose for the testing here or what? Uh, the pipes in the distribution system are fine, those are put in and rated at about 250 psi, and we're yeah. talking 90 psi is the high. And for the for the homes that we're going to experience anything 
around 80 PSR or higher, we went in and pre-installed pressure reducing valves mm -hmm. on the customer services so that they would never see that high pressure. Uh -huh. So that protected their home plumbing. Household appliances, refrigerators, dishwashers, things of that nature, over 80 pounds, you void your warranty. So we needed to keep the pressure below 80 pounds. Okay. So we pre-did that. So now we're starting to work on improvements needed to implement the second phase of the 640 pressure zone, which includes uh, water main upgrades, additional pressure reducing valves, another pump station that will be located uh, on the current site of our Tacoma point of delivery three, which is in the Bridges development around 288th and 120th. Our 125,000 gallon tank recoding and structural improvement project was completed earlier this year. The tank is located off, off of 98th, just north of East James Street, and provides water to our 485 pressure zone. That's the pressure zone between the East Hill and the Valley. The project included an interior and exterior recoding, security and access improvements, a new roof, roof vent to meet Department of Health requirements, and an additional sample line to allow staff to check water quality at both the top and bottom of the tank. And it also included a new fall restraint system that employees use when they climb it. As part of our in-house water main replacement program, staff have replaced water main on First Avenue South between James Street and West Cloudy in the Valley. They connected two dead ends on 80th Avenue South to create a loop system for increased fire flow availability and replaced water mains on Southeast 229th Street on the East Hill and are just now finishing up 45th Avenue South on the West Hill. In addition, we had eight inch water main on Wreath Road between 42nd and 38th replaced with 16 inch water main for increased fire flow capacity. Our SCADA staff continue to work on programming on programmable logic controllers or PLCs for short. I like that better. SCADA is the acronym for supervisory control and data acquisition. It's uh, SCADA is the window into our, into our water system. PLCs are micro, mini microcomputers that are the brains of each station. The PLCs are just like a personal computer. Over time, they become obsolete and are no longer supported, and they need to be upgraded. This year, our primary and backup master PLCs were upgraded, along with our pump station number four uh, PLC on the West Hill. SCADA staff also take care of storm and utility sites. And this year, they replaced the 84th Avenue pump station and a, a lagoon station at the Green River National Resources Area's uh, PLC. Overall, the SCADA staff maintain 52 stations uh, that have control systems. Last year, staff cleaned and inspected our Blue Boy tank, 640 tank, and 640 tank prior to placing the 640 pressure zone in, in service. And we also worked with a diving company to clean and inspect our six million gallon two reservoir lo located at Garrison Creek Park. So those were highlights of some of the bigger stuff that was completed over the past year. Now I'll touch on some of the things we're working on going forward. Our generator and electrical upgrade project at our Clark's, Clark Spring source is underway. The new backup generator has been delivered and is being installed uh, currently. The project also will include upgrades to the motor control centers, pump drives, automatic power transfer equipment, and control system upgrades. You can see how big that generator is. <laughs> how long do generator last, do you know? Oh, gosh. I bet you generator life is 40 years, 50 mm. years. Oh. Um, they, they're on a, a really good maintenance program. Mm -hmm. I think the, uh, we have a diesel backup pump at pump station four. It's not a generator, but it's a fire flow pump that's there in standby. And I think that station was built in 56 and that pump's been there since 56. Wow. And it still runs today. Staff will continue to work on PLC upgrades. We have one project remaining this year at our pump station number seven facility on the West Hill and another one at our pump station five facility that we will begin uh, early next year. 
Our SCADA system communicates through radios that are very reliable, but our current radio, radios are 20 plus years old and are no longer manufactured or supported. For us to get new radios, we have to go onto like eBay to find them. So we're working on a project to replace them with a new version. Oh, hello, Mr. Wong. Uh, so we're working to replace them with a new version that has additional security features. The new radios will scramble their signal, signal when transmitted and unscramble the signal when received at the other endpoint. This will better protect the integrity of the control system from malicious activity. Continue to work through re rehabilitations of our well sources. Well rehabilitations include pulling the well pumps and motors to check the conditions and rebuild and or replace uh, the components if needed. The well casing and screen are videotaped or video inspected and then the well is cleaned based on the conditions that are found and then re-inspected with video. So far brushing and bailing are all that's been needed. Other methods would include injecting air or chemical treatment. Then the pumping components are reinstalled, and this process is recommended every 15 to 20 years. Uh, we're currently working on our well number one at Armstrong Springs out in Covington. We just wrapped up well two uh, last year. Construction of our five million gallon reservoir on the West Hill kicked off in March of this year. T. Bailey Incorporated out of Anacortes, Washington is our primary contractor. T. Bailey also built our 640 tank on the East Hill back in 2010 to 2011. Early work included clearing the site and excavating for the tank foundation and spread footing, which is what you see in that picture. That was followed by installation of concrete forms, about 260,000 pounds of rebar for the foundation and ring wall, and 30,500 pounds of bolts and nuts for the ring wall. Uh, they then uh, poured 1,800 cubic yards of concrete. <laughs> I think the earth is going to tilt when it's done. <laughs> Installation of underground utilities, control vaults, and stormwater det detention followed that. Steel for the tank shell should start arriving on the site at the end of this month or into early September, and then you'll start seeing things going upwards. Construction is on schedule and should be completed by next summer. And it'll hold five million gallons. As I mentioned, the next reservoir improvement project underway is at our six million gallon number one tank. That's located on the same site as the 125,000 gallon tank we just wrapped up off 98th. This project will follow the same concept as our previous two tank projects at Clark or a Cambridge tank and a 125,000 gallon tank. There will be guardrail safety improvements, a new roof vent to meet the Department of Health requirements, seal welding on the interior of the shell of the tank to prolong the life of the tank, as well as to pro provide a better surface for the paint coating to adhere to, and an interior and exterior recoating. You can see the vent in the center of that picture. It's got a cover on it and it's screened and it meets the requirements with the screen. Uh, but their concern is that rain at a side angle can collect stuff off the top of the tank and get, get its way through the screen. And so today's screens have a cover that go all the way over it, better protect it. There are two water main replacements underway uh, downtown this year. <clears throat> water main on East Titus and East Sar Street between Railroad Avenue and Central Avenue are being upsized to 12-inch water main for increased fire flow uh, availability. Northwest Cascade is our contractor and will, be, and will be breaking ground as soon as pipe gets delivered. As I mentioned earlier, it's been kind of tough getting water parts this year. We're also working on design for a 12-inch water main replacement project in 2022 on North State Avenue between East James Street and East George Street. For our in-house construction projects, we are starting to install water main on 5th Avenue South at, at Rachel Place, uh, either later this week or first to next week. We'll be adding two 12-inch connections to a 16-inch water main on Kennebec Avenue at East Ward Street and East Meeker Street and running 12-inch water main across Kennebec for future water main uh, project to connect to. 
We will also be replacing two 16-inch water main isolation valves on East Valley Highway at 200th and 208th Street. There are two other projects that are in the planning and design phase that go along with the West Hill Reservoir project. A new pump station on Veterans Drive and a water transmission main to transport the water up Veterans Drive and south down Military Road to feed the new reservoir as well as the upper pressure zone. This will be a more efficient way to move water up the West Hill and it will provide redundancy for the system. With the Alexian Gateway development going on at Military Road and Veterans Drive, we included approximately 1,500 feet of 16-inch water main with our water main uh, projects on East Titus and East Sar so that we could have them installed before frontage improvements were made uh, or were constructed by the development. We didn't want to go back in and tear something brand new up. These projects are in our capital improvement plan for years 2024 and 2025. As part of our Clark Springs Habitat Conservation Plan, there are habitat conservation measures that are part of, of the approved plan. These habitat conservation measures are projects that make improvements to Rock Creek and the habitat around the creek. HCM5 is a project to replace non-fish friendly culverts on the Summit Landsberg Road out of Clark Springs and Maple Valley. This project was recently awarded by Council to Scarcella Brothers and construction, or construction for just under $2.3 million. When you remove the water and sewer bid tabs out of that, uh, that Seuss Creek and Covington Water District will cover, our portion will be about 1.9 million. Construction ex is expected to start with the fish window in 2022. HCM8 is another habitat conservation measure within our Clark Springs Habitat Conservation Plan. It sets aside money for habitat restoration improvements. The city purchased a property along Rock Creek known as the Phillips property back in November of last year. We are currently in the process of obtaining permits uh, for the demolition of structures located on the property. And once those building structures, structures have been removed, we'll work on restoring the habitat within the creek area. Gaberson Reservoir was constructed back in the 1930s as part of the Works Progress Administration. Gaberson Reservoir holds 3 million gallons of water for peak day demand and fire flow purposes, supplying water to our valley system and the West Hill portions. The reservoir had uh, developed leaks that were being captured by the underdrain system, and after further investigation, we found that soil was migrating through the underdrain. That's not good. In 2016, we lined the entire reservoir with a hypalon liner to extend the reservoir life, which brought the leak down from 5 gallons a minute to less than a quarter gallon a minute and it continues to perform well. But we'll be draining and cleaning the reservoir this fall and inspecting the liner with the manufacturer who installed it. Okay. SR 516 Jenkins Creek Road Widening Project continues to move forward. This is a road project with the City of Covington and Washington State Department of Transportation that will impact our transmission mains from Clark Springs, Kent Springs, and Armstrong Springs. The project is currently out to bid with a bid opening uh, coming up later this week on August 19th. During any water main outages, we'll have workarounds with other water sources like our Tacoma Supply and in-town sources, so we'll, we'll be able to work around the project. And a new project from Covington. The City of Covington is starting to work on another road project that will impact our Clark Springs and Kent Springs trans transmission mains. Covington is working on a road project that will replace a culvert for Little Seuss Creek at the Eastern Kent City limits on SR 516 and Covington Way. They're in the preliminary design stage and are looking at either a box culvert or bridge option. It's too soon to know what the impact will be, but we are working with the city and their design engineers um, and keeping abreast of what's going on. So, probably have more for you next year. And finally, Washington State Department of Transportation is working on a Highway 167, Highway 509 interchange project that will impact the Tacoma Pipeline 5. As partners with Tacoma, Covington Water District, and Lake Haven Water and Sewer District in the regional water supply system, we are part owners in the pipeline and responsible for costs incurred with maintenance and repair, or in this case, relocation. WashDOT is currently in the design phase with construction expected to take place in 2022 or 2023. The city's portion of this relocation is expected to cost about $2 million. 
or 11% of the relocation cost. So that was a snapshot of key things being accomplished that are affecting the water system. There are many other projects happening in addition to normal maintenance activities, sampling, water treatment, things of that nature. Uh, so with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. That's a, that's a lot. <laughs> it is a lot. Thank you, Sean. Appreciate that. I look to my left. Any questions for Sean team? Okay, to my right. Include more pictures from the uh, West Hill project next time. <laughs> yeah, they'll be different looking next time, that's for sure. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Hey, thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. Got, oh, Thank you for your time tonight. It's okay. Go ahead, please. On the, on the Jenkins Creek Road there, there's, I know the Covington's been talking about this a long time. Financially, how much are we into that? I thought it was just the state of Washington and Covington, but now it looks like Kent's involved in that too, that... Right, as infrastructure owners in the right of way, yeah. it's on us to move our infrastructure for the project. Um, I believe the last number I saw in the estimate, like I said, it's out to bid right now, was 1.9 million. That's our portion. Our portion. So between that, the potential, the other Covington one I mentioned at Covington Way and the Tacoma project, we're looking at about $7 million in projects that wow. we'll benefit from. So when would that, the one on Jenkins Creek, when would that start oh how are I, see this, I see the signs up you know yeah they got to award it uh have the pre-con all that kind of stuff i'm guessing after the first of the year probably end of this year after yeah the, the end of this year early okay next year thank you but we've been talking about that project since like 2005 i know i know so it'd be nice to uh, finally pull that off my update <laughs> Okay, hey, thanks a lot, Sean. You know, we take a lot of things for granted, right? So um, I have gone to a place when you taste water and it just doesn't taste good. But in City Kent, we got good water here. So keep up the good work, and you guys um, do a lot of job trying to make sure that our water supply stay top quality. So thanks to you and your team. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay, we're going to get started with our next presentation from... Uh, Kent Senior City Need Assessment from our Parks Director who goes by the name of Julie. One name, that's all she has. So, Julie, <laughs> all yours. Good. Hi, thank you, Councilmember Boyce, and uh, hello, Mayor and Council Members. Happy to be here. It's been actually a while. I feel like I haven't seen you guys in a while. Um, <laughs> Here, for the record, obviously, not, you all know me here, but Julie Paris Canola Kent Parks Director. And then uh, this is kind of a, a joint presentation, so I'm going to kind of kick off the front and the end, but in the middle. I also have our consultant who worked on this project with us, Burt Consulting. They're here, and that is Allegra Calder and Chloe uh, Kinsey. And then also, of course, our, our leader over there at the Kent Senior Center, Cindy Robinson, and she's here in case there's any follow-up questions. So we have a goal here. We do want to try and get through it, so I am asking if you can hold your questions because I think we may uh, answer them, but we did leave time just in case there's questions or any kind of discussion at the end for you all. So we're going to go over, obviously, just a little bit of history, uh, you know, what a needs assessment is and is not, you know, why we wanted to go a little bit deeper with our senior population and understanding their needs. A little bit of caveat, sometimes needs assessments need some interpretation. I just want to give you some of that framework. Some general information and uh, detailed information also on how we approach the project. And then a summary of what we heard from all of our seniors and, and how we engage. That will be uh, Burke's kind of primary portion. And then I'll give you some food for thought and then we'll talk if you have any questions. Sound good? Yep. Okay. So, uh, you know, just quickly, just a reminder, you know, we in the city of Kent and Kent Parks have been delivering programs to seniors for over 55 years. We've definitely evolved. We haven't always been at the Kent Senior Center, uh, but we've definitely always delivered programs for older adults. Uh, on average, currently right now, at least pre-pandemic, we're still working our way back up to those numbers. You know, we saw maybe 250 to 300 seniors do drop-in activities and to just hang out at the senior center daily. So you can see it's very highly used, maybe 80, 90,000 annually uh, use the facility. We did, as you know, in 2019 receive new additional funding from the King County Levy to begin focusing some work and uh, really isolating in how we are looking at our senior programs. You all are aware too, we have presented our 2020 through 28 recreation program plan, which did quite a bit of uh, work as well in the community. We have a needs assessment done at that at a high level. 
And then, of course, uh, like everything, we this project was a little bit delayed. We were supposed to do it a little bit earlier, but of course, the pandemic hit. And then, how do you outreach, especially to seniors who are more in an at-risk population? So we had to hold it, but we're done, close anyway, and moving forward. Just a reminder, a little bit of the guiding strategies. Um, senior programs and healthy aging is a core program area for our recreation division in Kent Parks. It always has been, and it really aligns with our uh, top community outcomes. And for us, we do track all that we do for healthy aging. Um, senior programming and healthy aging uh, aligns with, of course, our city council framework and council goals of thriving community and inclusive community. And um, also our new uh, Human Services Strategic Plan has one exclusive goal entirely around uh, making sure older adults thrive in our communities as they age. And it's just really important, you know, lifespans, we are definitely living longer that does not correlate to living better and to quality. And so our role is to try and figure out how do we help make sure quality of life sustains all the way through end of life. And so that's something that we really focus on. And then it's just important to understand, in this particular case, we have a needs assessment, but typically you would then do a, a larger analytic with you know, all of your funding sources and all your strategies. We have done that with the recreation program plan, so these are actually in correlation with each other. We just chose in this particular area to dive a little bit deeper. And um, so kind of you know, considering why do we really need a needs assessment, you know, seniors in our community are about 35% of our population. It's a massive size that we have to be considering, and not just considering the seniors now, but hmm, I'm heading that way myself, <laughs> and it's considering the future seniors still to come, and what's that system gonna look like, and are we prepared for that growth to come in? And of course, now I heard you know we're one of the fastest growing cities, so I'm like, ah, Mm -hmm. Who's coming and, and how are we going to serve and so on. So we really needed to dive a little bit deeper on what are some of the challenges our seniors are facing. Intuitively, uh, I think nothing in this report really surprised us, but what it did is validated and that was really helpful. So it really identifies the key issues out there that our seniors are dealing with. And through a multiple different ways, you know, through survey work, through one-on-one -on -one conversations, through data analytics, through demographic analytics. So you all know that we look at multiple different things. It also helps identify what's happening right now. What is the current landscape and then where can we evolve it or where can we fill gaps if there are gaps. Um, the other thing that it's just important to understand too is a needs assessment is not a business plan, it's not a feasibility study, and it's not a, um, a strategic plan. Um, and so it doesn't really dive deep into whether you should pursue something, how much the cost would be to pursue something. They basically are presenting the need. We then take that professionally and really analyze on where we can adjust and shift. So I just wanted to put that caveat out there. The other challenge sometimes too is a lot of needs assessments are based on subjective opinion and uh, realities or actual programs could be occurring. It might be an awareness issue. It could be you know, other things. And so those are the kind of things that we would vet through. Is this really a gap? It's showing as a gap. Let's talk about it and so on. Um, the other thing too to consider too is that if there is a gap, it doesn't mean Kent City government fills that gap. There might be community-based organizations or other types of services out there that they, this is their focus, they can fill that gap. But it is important for us to know what it is and of course work together. Uh, the other thing too is um, a needs assessment. There's a lot of other things that can determine whether we have needs such as wait lists, you know, classes filling at capacity, surveys, all of that type of stuff. So there's multiple things we all look at and this is uh, definitely one tool we definitely use and appreciate. Um, so why a little bit deeper? Like I said, we have a huge population in this city and we need to figure out how we uh, really advance this and begin planning for those seniors still yet to come. And so understanding a common baseline of, of how we uh, support our services and our seniors and um, how do we work with our city right now, community partners and so on. Uh, it really helps talk through community priorities. I think you'll hear from Burke here in a minute. There definitely is some rising themes that we need to be considering. Um, in particular, we are really trying to outreach more to our BIPOC seniors. A lot of our cultures in Kent almost bring their seniors closer to the chest and, and hang on tighter. And we wanna make sure how can we embrace and make our senior center as culturally welcoming as possible. 
Um, we are trying to figure out, you know, if you only have one dollar, how can you serve the broadest base first and then try and figure that out. And those are the kind of things that will help us prioritize our funding to the best way that we can so we're leveraging it in the right way. Uh, also alignment with other city uh, policies, our departmental policy, so it, all of this just kind of talks and works together. And then it, this has really helped us begin to kind of consider what is really our role in senior, uh, both social recreation and other types of services, and what are other people's roles? And making sure they also know those roles. So we definitely, once this uh, plan is complete, it's, it's close, we have a few things, we will be sharing it with others so that they're also aware and can begin understanding needs at a high level, because it honestly takes a village on how we are all gonna pull this all together. So I'm just going over a little bit of anomalies and I'm gonna pass it off to Burke to tell you what they heard. Um, the first thing, we're complicated there at the Senior Center, story of our lives over there. The uh, Kent Senior Center is actually considered a regional hub, meaning we actually serve not just Kent, we serve quite a bit of the surrounding community. And it, it uh, flip-flops a little bit, and it's very hard to compare demographics to just Kent, because how would you do it? You'd have to look at demographics for Renton and Tukwila and Auburn, right? So in this particular case, we just really studied just the Kent demographics. I just want you to be aware there is a regional uh, draw in this case. The other thing that the needs assessment really looked at is focused a lot on our registered programs. We have a lot of trips and tours and a lot of actual classes you can actually pay a fee for and actually go to and take the class. We also have another side that's the social side and, and the free and the subsidized. You drop in and you just experience and you're there and in our meal programs, et cetera. So there's a lot of different things that we were looking at. We really focus a lot on some of our registration side, so it's just something to think about. And when you look at the attendance, it's almost flip-flop. People from surrounding communities actually come to Kent to take our registered programs. So when you look at uh, resident, non-resident, in our registered classes, more non-residents participate than residents. However, on the flip side, if you just want to go there and have fun and you know play pinochle and enjoy the food, whatever, that's flipped. We have more Kent residents coming and less out of city residents. So it's a, it's a little bit of an anomaly to try and understand you know, some of that dynamic. So I just wanted to share that with you all. And then uh, when we actually launched this project, we did not have the 2020 census data yet. So this is still using some older sources and uh, we'll share that. But uh, we definitely will be looking at 2020 census data and see if anything's necessarily changed our mind and so on. So I am now uh, just gonna pass it off to Burke. They're gonna share and then I will come back and close and then open it up for questions. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks, Julie. Uh, and good evening, Council Members and Mayor Ralph. I'm Allegra Calder, and I will start off and then shortly pass it over to Chloe. So, um, as was mentioned, we use sort of two categories when talking about we have seniors, um, 65 plus, and then we have the older adults, 45 to 64, a category like Julie, I find myself in now. Um, and the reason for this is that we want to think about who are we serving now, but in order to sort of serve better and think about how we might, might evolve, we do want to think about what does it look like in the future. And there are some differences there. Um, Julie already mentioned that the older population is just growing as a share of population. It was now, when you look at older adults and seniors, so basically 45 all the way to you know, probably over 100, you're at 35 percent of the population up from 27 percent in 2020. So older adults make up a larger share of the population. And when you look at the group you know, that, that I'm in, um, it's more diverse uh, than the current senior population. So we would expect um, that programming is going gonna, is gonna to need to change and that we'll be looking to um, both have participation from a wider range of the population and uh, be broadening in that respect. One bit of, I think, good news is that during the pandemic, we've had a lot of conversation about the shift to online um, and the need for sort of virtual programming. And there's always, parks departments are always under pressure to have online signups. 96% um, of adults in the 55 to 64 category actually have internet access at home, which was higher, honestly, than I expected. Um, it's a little lower, 86% among those 65 and older. Um, but I would expect that those are likely to maintain and probably improve um, just given that internet is now becoming such a part of basic infrastructure. 
So the, the information I just shared is from the community profile in the needs assessment, and that is using uh, demographic and other data to sort of talk about, you know, who is the population um, in terms of, you know, race, ethnicity, age, gender, income, um, but also looking at access to um, health care. There are some data that we can get from um, King County uh, Public Health that talk a little bit about outcomes. Um, and then access to transportation and internet connectivity that I just mentioned. And so that will be the sort of, you know, who are we and who, who's coming, if you will. Uh, we also wanted to understand who else is serving the community and what are the kind of program offerings that they have. And so we did do some interviews with providers and nonprofits. And then we surveyed the community um, and got 895 responses on, um, you know, sort of needs and any barriers people were experiencing and just sort of general thoughts on how um, the city could better serve um, the needs. And then we did the very tail end where it was feeling a little more optimistic. We were able to do one focus group at the Senior Activity Center. Um, and it was a, just, just the one group, but it always allows us to actually follow up with people and just dive a little bit deeper into responses and understand um, a little bit better where some of that's coming from. So we were guided by a number of questions, you know, primarily around whether the services offered by the City of Kent are meeting the needs of the senior and older adults in the community. Um, but again, you know, you're not the only provider of services, so we wanted to put that in the context of what other services are provided and who's out there serving in the community. Um, and although it was a more challenging time and it was delayed, as Julie mentioned, there's a lot that happened in the pandemic that I think we wanted to try and learn from. Um, I think we all, um, in city government, I put you in this category, where suddenly things we thought you could never do, uh, you did quickly. And so I think there's some things that we wanted to check, you know, should we, should we continue with some of the virtual programming? And then I think this is important for you, as is, you know, we, we're always faced with limited resources. Um, there's probably growing demand in this community, and so how do we think about you know, how we best serve, um, what's the city's role, what, what may need to be others' role if, if we have limited resources. So those are the kind of questions that I would expect um, that you all will be grappling with. So I'm going to pass it to Chloe here in a minute. Um, these are the areas of need that she's going to walk through. Um, as has been mentioned, this comes from, you know, we ask people kind of what do you need and we heard from them. Um, and so sometimes people don't necessarily distinguish between kind of what you do and what others, others do. Um, but again, we're kind of reporting back on what we heard and then we're offering um, a number of sort of options to think about. And again, this is not yet sort of full recommendations, but just, you know, how are the ways that you might address those needs? So I will turn it over to Chloe now. Thank you, Allegra. Uh, good evening, Council Members and Mayor Ralph. All right, I will continue um, with the areas of need that we identified, and I'll cover some of what we heard in terms of the needs, and then uh, some of what we heard in terms of potential strategies to address it. And like Allegra and um, Julie mentioned, there are um, your, the, those strategies are based on um, input that we heard from providers in the community and from community, community members. Um, they really run the gamut. You'll see there are some that are you know, ideas that folks have that are actually services that the Senior Activity Center already offers, and it's really a matter of awareness, and then there's some that are um, what would be very involved programs. So you really see a range there, and we'll give you some context on those strategies as well. So the first need area identified was community and, and inclusion. Some of what we heard is that there are opportunities to better serve older adults and seniors of different races, genders, and cultures. There was um, the, the population, uh, the older adult population of Kent looks a little bit more diverse in terms of race and gender than did the registered participants in Senior Activity Center programming. But as we heard earlier, the registered programming is only a portion of the total programming and actually overrepresents folks from outside the city of Kent. So that is one caveat to that detail. But we did also hear um, in interviews and in our community survey that folks are interested in a wider range of cultural programming. About 31% of respondents uh, to the interview said they were interested in seeing a broader range of cultural programming. There also are opportunities to better serve older adults and seniors who work, volunteer, or have other obligations during weekdays. Um, in the survey, about 25% of respondents said they would be more likely to use the Senior Activity Center if there were offerings, more offerings on weekends, and about 20% said the same for offerings on weeknights. Um, so that 
Uh, and that was actually the second, uh, second most frequently cited barrier to participation in programming at the Senior Activity Center. So moving forward on strategies, some of the strategies and ideas we heard, um, and actually just to give you a little context first here, um, as you'll see we have um, some information on whether the city's role would be direct or as a partner in implementing this potential strategy, um, what level of resources would potentially be needed and a potential timeline. We worked with city staff to kind of give you a high level there, but um, as Julie mentioned, this is not you know, this is not a, a business plan or a strategic plan. That's just sort of some guiding information to give you. So the ideas here under potential strategies for community and inclusion were hosting regular meetings for providers and community organizations that work with Kent seniors, which would allow for um, greater alignment and awareness of, of what programming is being offered by different organizations. Prior to the pandemic, the Senior Activity Center had um, started conducting pop-up events in partnership with community organizations to broaden the range of cultures um, represented or to, to give a broader range of cultural programming. And so that is something that could be continued and expanded. Um, potentially expanding times and locations of programs offered, um, specifically possibly weekend or weeknight activities. And then potentially offering childcare at some of those pop-up events. Something that came up was that seniors who um, provide childcare for children in their, their family may not always be able to um, attend events. The second need area is health and wellness. A major need identified here was programming to prevent social isolation and support mental health. This is not a need that is unique to Kent. This is true of um, seniors across the region and across the country. About half of seniors in the city of Kent actually live alone, which was something that came out of the, that was a finding that came out of the demographic profile. And there's a high level of interest in these types of services from the community. That was something we heard both in the survey and from providers um, in the community. Some strategies around uh, health and wellness and particularly that social isolation element were first an idea of offering uh, programming for multi multi generational groups. There were some ideas like grandparent and grandchild activities, mm. activities that bring together high school students and seniors. Um, another idea is meeting older adults and seniors where they are, which could include other community groups, uh, worship centers, to introduce them to senior center services. And this is actually something that the Senior Activity Center has already started to do in low income senior housing communities and something that could be continued and expanded to other um, areas in the community. Uh, partnering with community organizations that offer culturally appropriate mental health treatment and counseling services. The Senior Activity Center does a lot around mental health and counseling and support groups. Um, but as we know, there's a wide range of languages spoken in Kent and a, a, a wide range of cultures. And individuals may not be comfortable pursuing counseling in, um, you know, in a language that's their second language or that they're not fluent in. Um, or if it doesn't come from the same cultural background that they have. So there may be an opportunity there to work with organizations that do provide those services in other languages and from a broader uh, range of cultural backgrounds. Nutrition and food security was also cited as a need. And once again, this is something that is not unique to Kent. Um, food insecurity can be a major and is a major need among the senior and older adult uh, communities. That was something we heard in interviews from participants in our focus group and from providers in the community. Um, and uh, there was also an interest um, potentially in meals and groceries from a broader range of uh, cultural backgrounds. Strategies here, so uh, the Kent Senior Activity Center um, has both a uh, subsidized lunch program and um, is, the, is the base for the Kent Meals on Wheels program and already, uh, already has the second largest Meals on Wheels program in King County, actually. But despite that high level of service, what we heard is that there's still, the need is still really high. So a potential strategy here is, is further supporting um, those low cost meal and food delivery services. Additionally, um, a program that um, several community providers mentioned was United Way of King County's grocery delivery service, which was particularly cited as being really good on providing uh, fresh food and culturally appropriate foods. 
And then um, there were some folks who expressed interest in um, accessing food bank services at the Senior Activity Center. We do want to note there that there's the um, city food bank is located in close proximity to the Senior Activity Center, so that may be um, maybe a question of just uh, connecting folks with the services um, that are already provided. Um, supportive services includes a range of things. We heard quite a bit about access to medical supplies, which could, could include things like wheelchairs, walkers, diabetes management supplies. Um, this was a particular one where we heard, heard this from quite a few people, but the Senior Activity Center actually already offers this through a lending closet. So this is definitely an area where it seems like um, you know, make, uh, promoting that awareness and making those, those connections uh, could be uh, really beneficial. Uh, there was interest in educational programming around things like the senior property tax exemption in King County and uh, finding housing, particularly for folks who are transitioning um, out, of, um, out of a single family home into a different, different housing format. Um, and just in general, um, we heard quite a bit about services that folks were interested in that we know that the Senior Activity Center already offers. So lack of awareness um, was a barrier to participation and there were about, um, that was actually the most commonly cited uh, barrier to participation in Senior Activity Center services in our survey was not being aware of what's offered. And the Sorry. The caveat I do want to give to that is that that is not something that's unique to the Kent Senior Activity Center or to Kent. You know, we work in a lot of different communities and people pretty much always say, oh, I didn't know that was offered. So it's, it's definitely a, a common theme and a common challenge that uh, <coughs> governments and, and public service providers deal with. So some strategies around here would be um, offering workshops around those educational uh, areas that folks were interested in, like applying for the senior property tax exemption, um, learning about housing options, which is something that the Senior Activity Center uh, did offer um, in person prior to the pandemic, so that could be um, done again. And then transportation. Transportation is a major need, not just in Kent, but in the region um, for seniors. A particular challenge is on-demand transportation and on-demand transportation for trips that go outside of Kent. There are a fair number of transportation services um, within the city of Kent and public transportation options, um, but not every need is met. Um, and knowing how to use and navigate public transportation was also, that was a, an issue that was um, raised by some community providers, um, particularly for those who don't speak English. So some ideas here would include providing educational programming around how to use public transportation, which is something that the Kent Senior Activity Center has done in the past, could potentially be expanded um, for folks who speak a language other than, than English. Um, and then uh, potentially offering or supporting transportation options, although we do want to note that those are, um, you know, providing transportation is an expensive, um, it's an expensive service, so that is something that would require a high level of resources and, and a more extended timeline. All right, and then um, just to kind of provide you a little bit extra here, we have some other additional general survey findings from that community survey. The first was that travel and fitness activities and nature-focused activities were the, um, the category of activities that the, the largest percentage of survey respondents were interested in. About 50% of our respondents said they would be interested if the Senior Activity Center offered more of those types of activities. The second uh, most popular group of activities were uh, social programs, education, arts and crafts, and volunteer opportunities. And then um, on a very positive note, uh, respondents hide, uh, rated the um, Senior Activity Center staff very highly and also the uh, maintenance and cleanliness of the facility and the cultural competency, competency of staff relatively highly as well. All right, and with that, I will turn it over to Julie. Awesome. So one of the things that honestly it drives me crazy is lack of awareness. So I wanted to highlight this really fast just for you all. This is actually not even, this is a, a major barrier we also heard in the recreation program plan. Both that barrier as uh, 
lack of awareness as well as, hey, can you be open evening, weekends, et cetera. So those were actually two we also heard that were validated and all the statistically valid work we did with the rec plan. So those are clearly ones that are rising to the top that we need to consider. So I just wanted to highlight currently how we engage. You know, we have, of course, our rec program guide goes to every household in Kent. Uh, at this point, it's like 60,000-ish around there. Uh, three times a year, and that does include senior programs. That guide is also available on our website. We have a senior center uh, newsletter that we do two times a month, and that's uh, growing, actively growing. We have about 1,000 subscribers on that. We also do our Kent Parks Recreation Newsletter, and we send that out two times a month, and that has almost 17,000 subscribers. Uh, we have, of course, the city's website and our Kent Parks pages, which we do have very specific pages directly related to seniors, and we will in the new, of course, refresh. Uh, we, of course, have our social media information that we share information on. We do on-site uh, signage at the Senior Center, event-specific brochures, flyers, you name it, at both City Hall, the Senior Center, and the Commons. We also have three Kent Parks commissions, and many seniors fill those roles for us. And we have a Kent Senior Center activity uh, advisory group that meets and helps Cindy and her team on different things. And of course, Cindy and the team do a ton of wellness checks, phone calling, all that kind of stuff. So currently right now, we do a ton of outreach. So you know, we do plan on following up with several of these groups and asking like, hey, you know, where should we be putting information out? Because because awareness, you know, it breaks my heart because we do a ton, uh, our departments for sure, but it, you know, we'll continue to work on that as well. A couple of things I just wanted to put in a little bit of perspective of the challenge of, honestly, uh, a lot of what we do in Kent Parks is, you know, we have a population of 135 and it's growing a thousand, right? So the, the challenge is how much do you invest and when and how? And, you know, over the decades, you know, we, we used to have eight career staff members, two van drivers. Uh, we now have no van drivers. We have four uh, FTEs out there. Two are on the finite funding, transition to levy funding. So the, the challenge we're going to have to ask ourselves at some point is how much do we really want to invest in our senior populations within the context of all the other needs that we have here in the city. And that's the balance that I have to walk. It's a balance, of course, that our mayor and then that you all will have to walk on. Hmm, how much do we really want to pursue in this case? In this case, we're not necessarily asking for anything right this second. We've got to analyze any kind of advancement or changes will go through the budget process, is that's normally how we would do things on advancing. We have the ability to do minor shifts and so on, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. But it is important to understand even thinking through expanding to evening program. We have a few things in the evening, but not on a regular basis. Uh, evening programming or even weekend programming, we also don't do that at the Commons. That's resources not just for Kent Parks in recreation. That's a demand on our facilities division and custodial, as well as our park ops staff on the outside. So it's, it's not as simple as it might seem to just, hey, let's open in the evening. So it's just something to consider as we're walking. And, and we'll definitely be vetting all of that type of stuff. The other challenge we continue to face is what is the role of government and in our profession and our roles is we are inclusive programmers, not uh, exclusive programmers or niche-based programmers. So it, it would be very financially uh, not cost-effective for me to make sure I'm delivering programs for very specific cultures or races. That doesn't mean we can't consider and explore multi multicultural things and cool ideas. It's just when there is a very specific need, you'll see in the needs assessment later when, when it's finished, is there's a lot of culture-based organizations that already do this for specific cultural groups. So is it necessarily our role? We might just be a facility provider and not the programmer. So we got to like work through all that and figure out what might be appropriate as we go through. Even with that, there's challenges because a lot of our, uh, and we have some pretty awesome groups here in Kent, want to use the community, the senior center, but we have revenue demands as well, and we program so far in advance, a lot of our stuff is booked. There's just not a lot of space. So we would have to reduce. And one of the things that I'm really sensitive about is the plan definitely validated what we currently do. We do a ton of programming and social service and health activities for our seniors. It, it worries me to, to um, uh, modify the baseline and modify the foundation because that could cause other issues and so on. So it's something that our team is going to really kind of dive deep now into what we've heard and what we might be able to refine. 
the other challenge that I have is we, we do have to kind of manage with best practice because I've also got youth that are a huge priority to me in the city. I've got adaptive and people with disabilities in the city. So I have, you know, we have a lot of demand. And so how am I going to balance and how do we manage this in a, in a fair way? And I mean, that's the story of our profession and we'll do that. And so what we do is propose to the best of our ability within funding sources what we can do. And that's what we've done to date. And so if the uh, you know, city council or our mayor wants us to continue to reinvest, then I, we definitely will do that and pursue that if that's so directed. So um, next steps, we have to finalize the report. We have some tweaking and some modifications left to do. And then we, unfortunately, we're, we're shifting back now to um, committees. So we will be sharing our report in more detail with the Parks and Human Services Committee. And so they'll get the full report. And we'll definitely provide that for the council too. Um, we will begin diving in, especially not in preparation for any kind of a budget amendment right now. It'll be more for the 23-24 budget on anything we think we might want to propose would probably come through that process. So stay tuned. We'll be busy working uh, over the next so many months on what we think we might be able to do. We uh, have started already as part of levy work, but we already are working with some of our community-based organizations and other uh, healthcare providers on how to bring more services to the, the um, center, and we'll continue to do that. We will explore anything that we're not, that we might be doing that's maybe far off from what the community and our seniors' priorities are. We would probably divest in that and then reintroduce new programs based on what we heard. Those are easier shifts for us. Um, I also want to talk to with, of course, Lori, and I, I forgot to mention Lori had a, a, a funeral service she had to attend, so otherwise she would never miss something like this, so I just wanted to shout that out for her. Uh, I will be talking with Lori about, again, I mentioned that um, all of our other program areas also allow, we don't have an age, you know, some things, right, but we, you know, we have community education programs, we have all these other types of fitness classes. It doesn't mean seniors can't go and do programs at the commons. You know, it, the, the senior activity is more of an isolated gathering, you know, uh, similar age and so on. So it's just understanding what are some of the other opportunities we might have to maybe market better or something that seniors can take those programs. Um, and then, of course, uh, budgetary needs. The other exciting thing that we're really excited about is uh, we're launching some new software at uh, the Senior Center. We've been doing some work out there, and it's called My Senior Center. Most of the local senior centers have them. Um, it's trying to track drop-in use. It's not like you know, every time a senior walks in, we're running after them like, hey, you know, what's your, what's your story? So it's almost like they come in, they sign, you know, they're already kind of signed up in the program. They log in, what, you know, that they're there today and what they're actually going to do there that day. They can register on site right at those kiosks. So it's pretty exciting. It's going to be the first time we're really going to be able to give very accurate numbers, and that's coming soon. And then, of course, uh, both myself, Cindy, and Lori, and the team will begin working through a way more detailed action strategy on this one on hmm, where do we want to consider and shift and move on. So with that said, that's it. And I've got pretty much everybody here who knows anything. If anybody has any questions, I can call people back up. So any questions on? Well, first of all, I want to say thank you, Julie, uh, Burke and Sultan, um, uh, for being here. Also, uh, Sydney, for all the work you do down there, we really appreciate you and your small crew. You're able to get a lot of things done. So I just want to say thank you for all you do. I have lots of questions, but I'm going to yield to my council member first before I go, and I'm going to start with you, Council Member Lomber. Not quite. Uh, when we originally submitted for levy funding, that was pre-pandemic. It's important to understand that. And the intent of that was to expand services, to really expand our reach into um, um, BIPOC senior communities, LGBTQI seniors, and so on. And then the COVID hit. And we had to reduce here at the city. So we had to reduce our staffing at the senior center as part of our reduction proposal. So we had to shift career staff to levy. We typically would have been able to hire new staff. So instead, fortunately, Cindy and the team are, are really overloading and trying to do as much as they can to attain. The, the needs assessment was actually funded by the levy. But we, at this point, I wouldn't say, I mean, Cindy, you'd feel free. I mean, I don't, I don't believe we've expanded per se. 
we both we switched the focus a bit. Um, some of the traditional things that we would have done uh, pre-pandemic are just not back on the table yet. We we focused a lot more on the outreach aspect, but we did shift the staff. So we we definitely lost career staff in the process, but the staff has uh, helped meet. We're, they're meeting our obligations that we have with the levy. That we are working hard to meet them um, for the funding. But yeah, mm -hmm. I hope that answers. Well, and uh, when the pandemic was going on, King County was a little bit more easy breezy with requirements on the levy. They knew the, it wasn't just us, all senior center, they were the first to close. And so there was no way we could attain. So they were a little bit more flexible. Now that we're open again, they're starting to kind of buckle down a little tighter, like, hey, okay, now we're back. You know, what are we all doing? And we're trying to explore what can we do? Lori's been working really hard on trying to figure out staff she can throw, you know, uh, transfer to the senior center temporarily to work on certain things. But it definitely is a challenge because we have a lot of expectation. And so what, what is happening is we, we don't want to lose levy funding. And so we're really trying to somewhat shift, but it's, it's kind of pulling away from what we would normally have done. So either way, it's a reduced model for now. Yeah. No. Well, I mean, I hope <laughs> not, not yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And the goal, I mean, I hope, you know, it's always hard to tell with uh, some of King County's levies. I mean, it's, it's finite. It's, it's a four year levy. So the question is, did we all do enough during a pandemic to even warrant going back out for a renewal levy? And that's where I worry because we have two staff members that are exclusively funded in there, not the general fund. And so the levy goes, they go, and then we have two FTEs out at the senior center. So it's something that we're tracking and we're aware of. And so we're definitely watching. And you know, most of the time, King County goes out constantly for the renewal. So we feel like it's a sustainable source, but it's always at risk. And my other question was on you know, the need to reach into the cultural community. What are we doing? I know we don't do a lot with translation right now. Mm -hmm. What is our plan for the future for translation? Well I, think to, well, I think we'll learn more with the race and equity plan that the city's working on. Uh, when we did our marketing and engagement plan in 2019, I personally met with probably 15 groups across the city myself and talked to their executive directors and multiple players. And we got warned against translation in mass quantity. So we're starting to dabble now in, in getting a few things kind of tested, like in the new rec guide, you know, we're gonna have translation so it's clear that there's scholarships and see if that drives change. But we uh, met with Culture Communities Board as well as cultural groups in the city and made it clear like there's no way we can translate the whole guide. Just not cost per heck, you know, because even if you tried the top five, I mean, it's, it's our highest cost item and so that's a real challenge. And I know Cindy works really hard on bringing when we think of our diversity of our own staff, that's one thing, but then we have our part-time base, then we have our volunteer base, and so we get the more we get to the front line, the more diverse we do get. And so we do have opportunities and we have partners. But right now, I mean, if you walked into the senior center, there's no like mass translation everywhere or anything like that, so we don't. But part of the challenge is how would we do that? You know, putting, uh, you know, even on our signage, even if we chose the top five that would even be a real challenge. So we haven't really thought too far. I think it's more when I talk to some of the groups, they talked more about the things that are important to that particular culture or race or whatever that you know niche is. They would define the things that they thought we should help translate. So it might be like a couple pages of the rec guide translated because that's more of what their seniors need or something or their youth need, not the whole the whole thing translated. So it's really working with some of our partners and then we talk about how do they then translate and get into their methods of communication. So to me, I really think it's more about relationships and learning about it and trusting each other and then coming back and working more together. And again, that also takes time because you've got to build and grow those relationships and trust. And so that's, you know, that's kind of where I would look right now, unless you've got anything that no, you want to bring up. Sydney, can you come up and talk on the mic? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Um, the only thing I was going to say on that as well is that one of the things we have been fortunate for the several years at the Senior Center is to have a lot of great volunteers and participants who are very keen on helping us when it comes on the one-to-one -one, uh, basis of translating. So if we have somebody coming in that needs help understanding what services are available, we do have a handful of our volunteers that we can reach out to to provide direct services. We did this uh, needs assessment online in, um, I think we did it in five different languages. Um, um, we had 
pretty limited success with people um, choosing other languages, but we, we did, that was something we felt it was appropriate and worth the cost to put it out there in those languages. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, we recently did a, uh, a survey for the Greater Kent Historic Society in our new Engage Kent Parks platform, it's kind of a new platform, and it translates into 108 languages. All words, all surveys, and it didn't necessarily draw more. That was, so I thought, ooh, I'm gonna get so much more, and I didn't, and so I really do think it's actually going to <laughs> people and talking and getting feedback because we can send tools out and flyers but again unfortunately that's just a staffing demand and we're so buried in actual program and operations that's a challenge but it definitely is top of mind for sure thank you marley um councilman fincher followed by core thank you uh, how many responses did you get for the survey um 895 Thank you. Turn your mic on. Oh, please. It is on. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, so that's that looks like a good number. Uh, on to Councilmember Larimer's question. Also, I suggest pictures and images in the in the guide. Also, sometimes they have not been really culturally. Uh, it, they were not culturally responsive or culturally representative. So to show that in images also I would be helpful. And I think that you're exactly right about the re relationships. You have to build those relationships and then maybe people will start coming. So I, I like hearing that. But I really enjoy some of the programming that you guys have done. I don't haven't been to a lot of it. But you went out to the apartment complex, the senior apartment complex, and did the plant the plant project. So are those more the types of things you're talking about going out? Right I now, hope that so. is actually absolutely an area that we are finding is a great way for us to efficiently use our staff time is we send a couple staff out to different housing places or as we expand with some of the various cultural groups in our community and we do things. So we have actually done three of the shag housings in downtown Kent for donuts and greetings and we go out there in the morning for an hour and a half where we have staff there and we just interact with the people in their courtyard outside and um, bring them together for a chance. It was, the last one was just so phenomenal. The people were so excited. They stayed the whole time. They chatted with us. They met each other. Um, and so it was great for us because a lot of them were like, wait, wait, what building are you again? And you know, so again, it's that awareness factor like they live here, they live in senior housing, and yet they struggle to know what we can offer. And the great thing with a lot of those senior housing places, they're right on the, um, the DART bus line. So, you know, and we are too. So mm -hmm. that handles a lot of the transportation issue for those individuals. Uh, and then you had the, uh, as far as other programming, you talked about people coming, or most of the people came from other cities into Kent to our social, to our activity center. So at Food Frenzy, one of the couples at our table was actually from over by Lee Hill. So do we know what cities they're coming from? Is it because they don't have a senior center? We have a better senior center and better programming, which I kind of think um, so. Well, if you ask those participants, we have a better senior center. <laughs> That's what they tell us. Um, a lot of, one of the things that has set us apart was our our lunch program. We have a very great lunch program and uh, many other senior centers use um, Catholic Community Services lunch program and we have had our standalone lunch program for over 20 years and people come for that. They're like, the food is so much better, I wanna come there. That's one of the things that draws us in. Also the particular programs, um, as you saw on the survey, the trips and stuff are Mm -hmm. really a hot priority in our groups and that brings people from all over because we absolutely have some specialty trips that you're not going to find at other senior centers and you bring somebody in for that type of activity and they're like oh wait I can get services for my mother here as well so it is really a lot of that um, and I am really excited about the new my senior center software because what that's going to track is the people that come in to play pinochle or they come in for lunch or just to ha have a cup of coffee with their friend and we'll collect the data that we haven't been able to collect because when you just signed your name on a piece of paper when you come in, that doesn't tell you anything. So um, that's going to help us recognize more what's within Kent. But we do have a big regional push in our programming. And especially during the pandemic, we took 
the lead of all the senior centers um, in our area on the mental health portion. Um, we had a very good, strong mental health program prior to the pandemic, and we were able to expand it during the pandemic to help even more. And so we actually became rather, uh, and from all the, uh, the VSHS funding, which is what we used to expand the mental health program, we were able to help the other senior centers around us that were also funded through that. So we kind of focused differently. Um, some, you know, some of our people would get some other services in Auburn that they, we weren't offering, you know. Um, and so the virtual programming was a really interesting um, expansion of the programs. Nice work. Thank you. Councilman McCor. Thank you. Thank you, Julie, and thank you, Cindy, um, for this great presentation. Um, Councilmember Fincher asked some of the questions, but some of the things that I, I wanted to point out is I think it would make sense for us to partner with CBOs on this because sure. uh, intentions are great that we want to work with our BIPOC communities. And I know seniors in my community, they don't have a place. They go to the temple. They sit there all day and they just chat. Like they need a place and they're looking for ways to get to the senior center. What they ask for is transportation. What they ask for is, you know, some sort of like programming for them maybe once a week. So I, I know that's happening for a lot of communities. So if we can partner with different CBOs or organizations, I know that we had that organization that started yoga classes here, um, Indian Association of Western Washington. And I heard about them through one of them contacted me, and then my dad started going to their classes. So it's sort of things like that we need to work on and partner with better in our community to, uh, you know, to support our seniors from BIPOC communities. Like we cannot wait until, I mean, two, three years down the road and we're gonna have, you know, because seniors need help right now, especially during COVID, they were so isolated and they were struggling mentally. And so we need to find ways ASAP and I think we, and I'm looking forward to your, your report mm -hmm. towards the end of the year. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilman McCora. Um, I'm just curious, um, there's other senior, senior citizen program out there and uh, sometimes we like to recreate the wheel. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, did we look outside, further outside, I can't at some other senior citizen and that is not to say that we're not thriving, but we want to get better, right? That's really doing the thing that we're not doing that could probably help boost attendance and people coming. Yeah, not necessarily in this needs assessment, but I know Cindy sits at the table with them yeah. all, all the time. Yeah. So I'll let her. So answer. I'm actually on the board of directors for the Washington State Association okay. of Senior Centers. I'm the treasurer and I have been for about, I think the last six years or so. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm actively involved with that group. And um, what you'll find, especially in South King County, is a very active network among the senior centers. We don't see each other as competition. We actually much prefer to thrive and support each other. And um, so yes, we actually were like, oh, they did that. That looks good. Is that something we can do? Is it something we should do? Is it something we should let them focus on? Um, the other thing is, honestly, this VSHS levy funding group is phenomenal. And um, just to address some of the cultural things, there are so many great cultural groups that receive funding through this. And one of the big part of the VSHS funding is to introduce and create those um, collaborative efforts. So I loved when the, uh, the IAWW program began with us, and I am so excited to get more of them back because we thought that was a great program and we are looking forward to building them back. You know, our doors have been open a month now. And so um, it's, we're rebuilding. Um, September, you're gonna see another big shift of programming occurring at the Senior Center as we bring back more of our registered programming. Um, but we're building ourselves back to in-person. We're not gonna go away from the virtual at this point. I know that is something that I have been working with IT um, because what we have actually reached in a manner that you never would have thought of is the people with um, concerns about leaving their house even prior to COVID the, with the phobias and stuff. We have people coming to support groups now that would never have had that opportunity before. So we're gonna be working with IT to continue to build those opportunities, how we can do both um, with staffing and uh, funding and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Oh, thank you. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I just want to go ahead. You want to say something? Well, I was just going to just remind this is where I always remind that public recreation serves a social service need. Mm -hmm. It's just always kind of assumed it's recreation. While there might be fun and like actual exercise, we do in a lot of areas, not just a senior center, do actual social human services based work. And so that's just a perfect example mm -hmm. of it. You know. Yeah. And my last comment, I do want to reiterate, I think Council McCord probably made a, a good statement. I mean, she has senior parents and just sits at the temple. I mean, to me, that sounds like an opportunity that maybe we could kind of go out and reach to some other organization and say, hey, what can we do to try to mm -hmm. embrace them and, and, and want them to feel like they want to come? I do want to say, Madam Mayor and team, we have invested a lot of money into that senior citizen, and I think... Uh, there's, we probably should look for ways to try to continue to make it work, right? And I think there's always uh, opportunity uh, for improvement. So when we look at doing different things, uh, pilot different things, maybe once a month you want to do something on a weeknight or, you know, on a weekend, you know, just try different things to try to see how we can, uh, you know, enhance what we're doing. And you are doing a phenomenal job, as I said earlier, but we want to always get better. That's who we are, strive to get better. So so I, I look forward to, you know, the final report. And then and as we go forward, you know, we agree that we made a big investment in it. So let's continue to do so. I think it's a great program. So personally, do you have bingo night? I love bingo. So <laughs> We don't right now. Oh, we're coming back. Bring, we'll come come back. Bring it back. Let me know, okay? That's a fun program. But. I definitely think it's something that Kent should be really proud of. I mean, we are really well known, and we do have one of the highest meal programs. And I mean, people come from other cities to Kent, you know, but then they don't necessarily give us their funding either. So, how do you do that? And so, it is something to be really happy that there has been investments over the decades, you know. So, it's good stuff for sure. Madam Mayor. Yeah, thank you, um, Council Member. So, first of all, I just want to take a very public opportunity to say thank you to Cindy and your team. COVID impacted our senior center and our seniors first, right? When we think about where we heard the first cases, who was most vulnerable and the biggest impact, it was it was at our senior center. That was the first place that we shut down, all of those things. Mm -hmm. You guys pivoted immediately to figuring out ways to keep people engaged through the, the virtual activities um, as we went on through the drive, the drive through um, act is so much fun, right? Getting to see people come through and just really wanting that engagement. And I would say the number one question that I received um, as we were coming closer to reopening was when's the senior center going to reopen? I didn't hear so much. I mean, city hall a little bit, but it was always when's the senior center reopening. So I just want to say thank you for keeping people engaged, for doing what you can do um, to make sure that that connection was there because mental health, I mean, it's, it's a big issue for all of us, but you, the isolation was, was extremely hard on our senior population. Council member, um, I absolutely committed to to continuing to fund and find programs and how we do things. And, and I can tell you, um, we are fortunate in Kent. And I think that this is something outside of here that we don't recognize. A lot of senior centers are not operated by the city. Mm -hmm. And so then when there were shifts in funding, like United Way funding, when their focus went from seniors to other places, there was not a solid funding source. So I'm definitely grateful for the investment that those became that came before all of us made and and chose to um, to build that senior center and and a hundred percent need to continue that investment. So yeah. thank you. Thank you, member. Council McCoy, are you good? You have another statement you want to make? I was just going to make a statement. Yeah. Uh, Mayor Ralph already uh, said beautifully, but I just want to reiterate, like, and you also said the same thing, that we need to be going out to the community. Uh, translations are, nobody's going to read that. And a lot of people don't read their recreation guide when it comes out, unfortunately. Um, so I think going out to various communities and community-based organizations and reaching their seniors where they're at is how you will be able to drive them into the senior center. So thank you. Once again, great presentation, Burke and Sultan. As always, you guys do a good job, so thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Rich. Oh, is Captain Fincher? Wait a minute, one more. I'm sorry. Come back. No, you don't have to come back. I was just going to say I like the new look on the um, on the program guide also. Thank you. So yeah, was, uh, yep. can't take all the credit. Multimedia did a great job on designing kind of some of our ideas. And, yeah. yeah, thank you. So thanks again, team. Appreciate it. Okay. Okay, fellow council member, we have 30 minutes, so we're going to grab something to eat. So thank you. Thank you.